coming up on this episode of NPS Now. Norfolk's two newest schools held ribbon cutting ceremonies, while another historic school celebrated its 100th anniversary. And fifth graders spent a day learning more about STEM at Naval Station Norfolk. Later in the show, we'll take a closer look at Norfolk Public Schools' educational planning process. All that and more next on NPS Now. Welcome to MPS Now, your source for news and information about Norfolk Public Schools. I'm your host, Karen Tanner. The third and fourth schools out of five being built for our district recently marked their completions with ribbon cutting ceremonies. Here's the story. The conclusion of two journeys were celebrated as the new Larchmont and Ocean View Elementary Schools held their ribbon cutting ceremonies. Because of inclement weather, Larchmont had their ceremony inside but it didn't dampen the spirits of the students, staff, and community members who are excited and grateful for this large, modern facility. It's really nice, and it's all new things, and it's just a great opportunity. Yeah. There are a lot of differences, but um, I think the biggest one is the, the appearance. The appearance, it just looks way different. Like. The entrance is different, there's no stairs to get in. Yeah, it's, it's a lot, lot different. Just to see this project uh, to, uh, to open with all the students and the faculty, the parents, uh, the administration, it is a world-class facility uh, right here in the neighborhood. Uh, Large Brown School will serve generations to come. Uh, our students will uh, get that education that they deserve and go on to become citizens of the world. The very next day, Ocean View Elementary's ribbon cutting took place in front of the school in sunny but breezy conditions. Like Larchmont, the many benefits this innovative building will provide for students was highlighted by several speakers. Both of these schools exist thanks to the strong commitment from the city, school district, and community, who all played a huge role in ensuring students receive every educational advantage possible. I think it's an opportunity for them to learn to be in a place where it truly is an extension of, you know, home to school and school to home, you know, just, just, just being excited. So I think for those students that get the opportunity to attend these new schools, it's going to make all the difference in the world for them. And we hope that they too will then come and grow and take our positions in the future and make sure that the children that follow will have similar opportunities as they. It's a great feeling seeing you're part of, uh, just a small part of making sure the educational system goes great here in Norfolk and Tidewater. And they've done a great thing in the city and this council and the school board and the civic leagues and the public, making sure this got built in the quality way they wanted and the educational things they needed and the STEM labs they needed. It's some great new technology and it'll be here for a long time. You know, bricks and mortar don't educate children. It's what happens in the classroom, what those teachers do, what those leaders, what that support team does. But the building shares that there's a commitment that the community has to where they learn. And so they have new technology, they have brand new learning spaces, and they have a chance to just grow and thrive beyond what we've all imagined. The past and present of the West Ghent community came together to commemorate the 100th anniversary of W.H. Taylor Elementary. Outside, students enjoyed a festive carnival despite the drizzly conditions. Inside, guests were invited to visit a museum filled with images from Taylor's past, which brought back great memories of this remarkable school. Former students, staff, and principals also had the chance to attend a special ceremony celebrating 100 years of teaching and learning at Taylor Elementary. It is exciting. Uh, we have been planning this for so long and just to see it all come together, it's so rewarding. Everyone is so excited to see each other. It's just like one giant family reunion. It's wonderful. It's wonderful, but I was in the old building, so I have enjoyed the tour. We didn't have all those computers and all of the other things that the kids have now, beautiful rooms, 
Oh, I'm so impressed, so impressed. Well, my daughter worked here when it opened up. She was the first librarian, so, and then of course Mary Ann, I hired Mary Ann. She worked for me at Little Creek, and then Charlene worked with me all over. And so I kind of owe a little bit uh, to, uh, to Norfolk Public Schools and to, and to uh, Taylor, Taylor Special. Actually, it's wonderful. You know, it, um, when, you, when you leave a place, there's a lot of sorrow. But I have so much joy for the people that are here. I just feel like I'm home again, and I just love so many people. And actually, the whole place, the community, this is a place where it all comes together. So it's really wonderful. Oh, I think it's wonderful that they've been able to keep the spirit of the old building. I don't know many schools that have been in neighborhoods that appreciated them so much. You know, it's, it's, it's really worked out well for them. And the people that live in West Gant are so appreciative of the school and love it so much. Approximately 2,500 fifth graders from Norfolk Public Schools visited Naval Station Norfolk for the first ever STEM day. While they were on the base, students learned about science, technology, engineering, and math through hands-on activities provided by the various groups who volunteered to be part of the special day. The Navy also arranged tours of the USS Cole and the USS Gerald R. Ford, along with a variety of other military vehicles. The goal was to get students excited about STEM and introduce the many different career opportunities available to them in the future. What we're doing is uh, showing them all different kind of exhibits with, uh, you know, our LCACs, landing craft air cushions, some of the aircraft that we have that ser serve our fleet and letting them meet the sailors. And we're trying to inspire them and we're also trying to give them a vision for what they can do with their life and also why, why uh, you know, studying the sciences is so, is so important. This is so important for our students because we need to ensure that our students are well versed and well prepared for STEM opportunities. The STEM workforce in the United States is growing. Um, in the next 15 years or so, there will be thousands of jobs that we want to ensure our students are prepared for. I hope they're able to make those very important connections with what they're learning in school every day. Um, our curriculum and instruction department did a magnificent job with developing lesson plans. The teachers have been implementing these lesson plans all week to prepare the children for what they would be learning today. It was actually a problem-based learning unit, and so they were um, identifying things about what's going on with the base, um, environmental challenges of the base and just uh, working together to solve problems. It really has been a great journey for the children. Oh, it's just been smiles, wows, ahas. The, the kids are just so engaged. No child here is asking to go to the bathroom or falling asleep. They are so engaged and they look like they, you know, walking away with um, souvenirs and asking lots of great questions. So it's been a great opportunity for these fifth graders. Students and community members here in Norfolk recently completed their first hour of computer coding during a special event that was also streamed live to the main branch of the Richmond Public Library. Norfolk Public School students and their parents were given an interactive opportunity to learn more about computer science during Virginia's inaugural Family Code Night at the Slover Library. The school district's Operation Break the Code grant made this night possible along with NPS partnering with the City of Norfolk, Slover Library, and Code VA. Throughout the event, students and the adults with them used coding to solve a variety of puzzles, and they learned several tips to help them along the way. With John Pierce, the director of FamilyCodeNight.org, as their guide, this was a fun way for these young people to be formally introduced to the world of coding. It's just a wonderful learning experience, and it really gets kids going on the path towards learning computer science, and really, more important than anything, believing that computer science is within their reach, because it is. For any kid today, any kid can learn computer science, and the critical thing is to start in the K-5 to five years, because that's when that belief is formed, and that inspires the track they can be on for the rest of their lives. Well, you know, the research tells us that minorities in particular and girls just do not think that they can do this. And also there's a myth out there about what IT is and what it's not. So if we can get kids engaged in this, it's actually so engaging that it's leveling the playing field. It doesn't matter if you're a super smart person, as long as you can get involved and learn these skills young and just continue to stay on this track, 
there is a real possibility you'll be able to go into the field and possibly not even do a four-year degree. The very next morning, there was a special Family Code Night workshop open to educators who were interested in teaching their students about coding. Those who attended this training were excited about what they learned and hosting their own Family Code Nights at their schools. I had no idea what coding was. I, you know, I did computer science, but you know, now it looks fun. You know, it doesn't look so hard, and so it just, um, I just, I know my students will love it because they love computers, they love playing games, and so I, it'll be pretty easy to get them into it. They've, they're already doing this at home. They just don't realize that they're doing it. So how to bring that vocabulary and give them the language to use so they understand the depth of what they're doing, that they're not just playing games. Um, I'm really excited about that, and I think they're going to be very interested in that. It's wonderful. I wish we could have more of it, um, more training in technology, and that's what we need to train our students because this is the cutting edge. So to prepare them to be productive citizens, uh, we need to equip them with everything that's out there. The Sprint One Million Project kicked off as representatives from Sprint donated a total of 300 wireless devices and free connectivity to ninth graders who didn't have access to the internet at home. This initiative is designed to help close the homework gap by ensuring that high school students with limited access to the internet are able to use broadband services to complete their schoolwork at home. This is my third, uh, my third kickoff this week, so it's been a terrific week. But I had a young lady um, two days ago tell me that uh, this device was going to help her get a chance to go to Yale. But this young lady said this is an opportunity for me to seize and be the best I can be. That's what this is about. In recognition of National Disability Awareness Month, NPS students with special needs took part in the third annual Disability Takeover at Why Not Italian Restaurant. Over the course of a few hours, students were able to shadow the Why Not staff in order to learn what they do and a bit about the food service industry. For these students, this was a chance to show off the skills that they have already learned, plus they gained valuable knowledge and work experience. I, I've been uh, watching how they put pizza in the oven and how it's cooked and, and how they and how they do the garlic, garlic nuts and how we how we fill in the cups of drinks. And we've been going going to a few tables and and, and we've been putting out orders that for what people want. It is so very important because as a part of our program with Transition, we work to make sure that our young adults have the tools and the skills that they need so that they can be employed successfully, not just employed, but they can have that employment as well as maintain the employment. And being in a situation in a business like this, they're able to work with the individuals and learn one-to-one, -one, hands-on skills that they can use in working in an industry like this. Norfolk Public Schools, in partnership with Special Olympics, held their third annual Big Feet Meet at Crossroads School. During the event, middle school students with special needs got the chance to compete in various athletic activities. Enthusiastic volunteers from local universities and high schools were on hand to assist students as they showed off their athletic skills. Today is a day that's just all about them. They get to come out here and show off their athletic skills. Um, even though they are disabled, they still can do some of the same things that their non-disabled peers can do. It's important for them to come out and have a day like this because we want to give them the same opportunity that we've given all the little kids at the Little Feet Meet. We want to be able to help them work on their fitness in fun ways where they may not really notice that they're actually working on things and it'll help improve their health in the long run and their overall well-being. Students at the Norfolk Technical Center presented pharmaceutical information to their peers while also gaining some valuable feedback. Today we have NTC's annual pharmacy fair. Today NTC pharmacy students are taking all of NTC through the wonderful world of pharmacy. Today my students are actually picked different topics and they're sharing with welding students, auto mechanics students, fashion design students, all the different aspects of pharmacy today. Today we also have a special guest which is Hampton University School of Pharmacy. I have a partnership with them for over 10 years now. So I have some P4 students who are actually evaluating my pharmacy students and giving them critiques on their oral presentations today. We have had a relationship with the Norfolk Technical Center for many years now and we've been working closely with Ms. Stokes. Uh, she has us come out here every year and kind of just help these students present better um, so that they can do better in the future. And 
make sure that they're being more thorough in their presentations, introducing themselves and just making them better presenters overall. It felt pretty good to present in front of the judges today because it made me feel that all the hard work and practice that I've been doing in class has really paid off. Um, it was nice to be able to have a professional conversation with people who know what they're talking about because it made me feel as if I can achieve that and that I will be able to be at that level and that I'm slowly getting there through the work that I've been doing in class. The lesson plans included uh, working on oral presentations. The students first picked out any type of topic as long as it pertained to pharmacy. I wanted, some, I wanted the students to pick a topic that was near and dear to them. As you know, pharmacy affects everyone. Pharmacy is in everybody's home. So I told the students, go out here and I want you to pick something that you've always thought about when it came to pharmacy. So they did. So the students actually researched their topic, we practiced it, I approved it, and we made it happen today at NTC. Juniors and seniors from across the school district took part in the Tidewater Post-Secondary Fair at Virginia Wesleyan University. Over 100 representatives from various colleges, universities, apprenticeship programs, and business technical schools shared information about their institutions and answered questions about admission requirements and scholarship opportunities. So yeah, basically you got a lot of juniors here from a high, from local high schools with a few seniors as well. And basically they give them the, run, the rundown of what they'll need GPA wise, financial aid costs, stuff like that. And then they'll kind of persuade them to come to their college. Um, I've been looking at like Michigan State and Virginia Tech and then also schools like I've been looking at for volleyball. And a lot of them like really informative, especially for schools I had no clue about, like what they like mainly studied and like their percentage acceptance rate. So those are like really good to know too because we're probably only like tied down to like a couple schools like in Virginia so this also gets us noticed like other schools um, and a lot of people probably think that they don't have like a chance in college so this also like helps us like realize like we can do this and like we should start like getting in the process of like applying to schools and everything so I think it's extremely important because it allows our students to be exposed to the college and careers uh, early on to find out specifically what is required to get into certain college and universities. So it's extremely important where otherwise they may not be uh, informed as well. The NPS Department of Music Education hosted the 22nd annual Urban Music Leadership Conference. This organization is a network of music professionals made up of school administrators and classroom instructors. Their purpose is to explore the opportunities music programs across the nation provide to their students. This is the 22nd annual Urban Music Leadership Conference. We housed them in 2010 and they're back for another visit. I would like the participants to take away inspiration for what we can do in urban school districts, um, enjoy the model and the best practices that they've seen here today. I want them to know that all of our children can learn at a high level. We have high expectations for all students, regardless of socioeconomic background. Um, and I hope that they, they have a great impression of Norfolk Public Schools, that they love our kids, and they go out and spread the word about the work that we're doing here, because it's really important. I think it's important that we see the programs that are initiated here, and to know that music is flourishing here uh, in the Norfolk Public Schools. Unfortunately, in so many of the school districts around the country, music is on the decline because there's not very much emphasis given to music. It's important that our group sees programs like this, that Danielle Ropley is doing a masterful job uh, of doing, and Dr. Boone, as superintendent, has endorsed in terms of furthering the cause of music and making all of our kids more uh, aware of music and what it can uh, do in our lives. School board members, NPS administrators, representatives from the Virginia General Assembly, and other guests met at the Norfolk Technical Center for the annual legislative breakfast. Board members presented their legislative priorities and positions, while those in attendance asked a variety of questions in order to better understand the school district needs and goals. Proper funding of public education and ensuring that effective programs receive funding were big parts of this important conversation. The, the CSAP, that I was really concerned about that, uh, really wanted to hurt the system, and that would really hurt Norfolk uh, if, if it do away with this, uh, this proposal in the state. And what we need to do is this, if, if it's broke, fix it. 
don't get rid of nothing, see. And I think the superintendent is right on time what she is trying to do for North and North. We've got to work with her at the school board and get it done. Well, I thought it was a very good interactive, good questions, good responses, um, trying to focus the aim. We need to laser focus on certain issues. I think the JLARC study will pinpoint some real cost that the state needs to cover. So, I mean, that's what we're looking at, trying to make sure that the mandates from the state aren't unfunded and that the kids get the education that they deserve. I thought it was great. You know, all the board members spoke up and said what they felt in certain issues. And, you know, everybody has their areas of expertise. And so they can really speak to those areas with passion, knowledge, and um, experience in the division. I'm very, very happy. I think we're going to have a strong General Assembly this year. And I think our board really has a fundamental understanding of what the division needs and where the General Assembly can help us. As part of Norfolk Public Schools United Way campaign effort, eight contestants squared off against one another for the title of Best Chili in Norfolk Public Schools. After careful judging from Superintendent Dr. Melinda J. Boone and members of her district leadership team, Samantha Wiggins from Richard Boland Elementary was named the winner of the competition, followed by her mother, Jennifer Evans, from Crossroads School, who came in second. It's, it's a really friendly competition. You know, me and my mom are really close, so it's really nice. But to uh, take what the chili that I grew up eating and just changing it just that little tiny bit and being able to win, it's amazing. If you have any great story ideas or events happening at your school, please be sure to contact us at NPS underscore news at NPSK12.com. Stay tuned for more NPS Now. Welcome back to NPS Now. With us today is Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Melinda J. Boone, and Tracy Richter, President of Cooperative Strategies, to discuss our most recent conversation about our enrollment and facility options that we're going to be talking about, that you just recently talked about. So first, Dr. Boone and Tracy, would you give us a little background about why and how this process came about and how your organization, Tracy, was selected for this work? Sure. Educational planning is an activity, an ongoing experience for most school districts, particularly districts of our size. And you have to go back and begin to look at impacts on enrollment. If you have increasing enrollment, you know, how are you able to support all the students in the classrooms that they need? Or if you have declining enrollment, how do you right size your, your district to, to deal with that? In, a, a, in addition, we also looked at the idea of uh, exploring what's the condition of our facilities. You know, we, we have 44 comprehensive schools and with our other auxiliary sites, we operate over 50 buildings. What do they look like in terms of their age? How does the district begin to set priorities around future capital needs and building construction or renovation? And so it's important for us to uh, periodically go back and review all of those pieces. To, to make sense of where we are and to make the best decisions of where we serve our children in, in the school buildings. Right. Tracy. So since 2013, um, Norfolk Public Schools put out a request for proposals for a planning organization to come in and assist them um, to really get an objective eye um, on the school facility planning world um, and to hire a firm that specifically does that. Now, we first came in to do uh, a real basic utilization study to look at that declining enrollment and see how facilities put, fit together. But we quickly learned that there was a lot of services that fit that tied the program activity to those facilities, to the condition of those facilities, even to the space types within those facilities. And so the, the goal now has become to combine all those things together in a continuous planning effort to make sure that we're going to meet the needs of students in the future. And Tracy, for what you've seen, give us a little snapshot of what the enrollment looks like right now for us and the factors that contribute to the changes that may have to happen or may stay the same. Sure. Um, you've seen, in the last 10 years, you've seen a, a decline in enrollment in Norfolk Public Schools. Um, in the past, um, it probably due to, and, and much like a lot of urban school districts across the country that face decline, but the recent decline in enrollment is really a demographic, um, a, a demographic piece that, you know, as we hit the recession in our country in the 2008, 2009, 2010 years, the nation saw a, na a national birth rate drop 
And so what we saw across the country was low entering kindergarten students um, about 2013, 14, 15, 16. Norfolk is, is not immune to this. Um, lower birth rates have contributed to lower enrollments that have pushed out those bigger enrollments from the beginning of the century. So completely a direct demographic impact to this recent decline. The good news is, is that we see some stabilization. We don't anticipate that, that decline that we've seen in the past, but more of a steady enrollment in the future years. Mm -hmm. Dr. Boone, this was important for him to review Norfolk schools because we're not immune, like he said, other school districts are doing this. So Tracy, what are some of the uh, creative plans or master facility plans that you're coming up with for Norfolk Public Schools that short term or possibly long term? So I think facility planning is really about short term and long term goals. Um, certainly our short term goals and, and, and Dr. Boone can speak far more to this is to, to help assist in her programmatic and academic goals to make sure those buildings can accommodate those program spaces. But for us it's really um, sometimes the short term goals are really about prioritizing the, the safety of schools, the, the warmth of schools, so we call it warm, safe and dry, um, to just make sure there's appropriate learning environments for students. Those are our short term goals, those maintenance needs that we have. Those long term goals of you know eventual facility replacement or balancing enrollment um, or program articulation that, that the facilities support those needs, those are more of our long term goals that take a while to implement and take you know a significant funding but also significant program direction that, that Dr. Boone has provided for us. Mm -hmm. So at the recent school board work session on November 1st, we talked about um, initial recommendations. Um, could you provide a few highlights from that of what some of those suggested first steps could be? Certainly. One of the, the opportunities we have with this planning process is to deal with excess capacity, additional space and seats that we have available at our secondary schools, particularly our middle schools. And we also have the fifth of our five schools that are part of the uh, PPEA, the Public Private Educational Authority, and Camp Allen is, coming, is under construction now. And so one of the things we knew when we went into this building process and the federal government approved uh, through the Department of Defense support for that school, that we needed to address the enrollment uh, the percentage of students who were military connected, which had declined over time. Part of that was due to the loss of carrier groups that were home ported in Norfolk. And so we hadn't seen as many um, of the families that were living in the base housing near Camp Allen. So we need to look at the boundaries for uh, Camp Allen and it, it shares a, a boundary with Sewell's Point Elementary School. So we, we, there were recommendations that came forward about how we address that and prepare to have an enrollment that relieves some of the pressure on Sewell's Point Elementary School and and then populates the new Camp Allen School with a number of students that's consistent with the building that was designed. Mm -hmm. So that was one piece of that. The board also has in all of its goals with its work to be able to address the uh, our being a, a district where uh, we're proudly diverse and, and very proud of those pr proudly diverse opportunities. But within that, we do have some areas where we experience hyperpoverty, where a predominant number of the students, usually 90 plus percent of the students, are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. And while poverty is not an indicator of a challenge to learning, it certainly, when, when concentrated, can represent uh, uh, the gaps and opportunities that lead to challenges for overall student improvement. And so how do we begin uh, in a district like Norfolk to reduce those pockets of hyperpoverty? And so one of the other recommendations that went to the board on the first deals with the pathway, the feeder pathway for St. Helena elementary school and a proposal, a recommendation that was made to the board to have those students take a pathway from elementary to middle at Blair and high school at Maury. Again, looking at how we begin to do better balancing of the mm -hmm. socioeconomics um, demographics in our schools. Mm -hmm. Tracy, what are some other schools that you can highlight in addition to what Dr. Boone just mentioned? So those are great opportunities to, that are, are good short and long term goals because they meet a lot of those. We are really paying attention to the Lake Taylor Quadrant um, in particular, um, looking at opportunities for um, better utilization of facilities. Um, you know, when we're talking about schools like Fairlawn and Poplar Halls and Lake Taylor Middle School. 
um, but also looking forward to the, the programmatic opportunities that the comprehensive and uh, career and technical school will bring to Lake Taylor High School and how we, how we can move forward on you know, what are the opportunities for both you know, neighborhood and feeder students that come into that building, but also to provide that division-wide choice um, for students to come in that provide certainly the academic opportunities for the mm -hmm. all division students, but also provides really a great opportunity for that diversity that, that, that this division strives for and maintains. Um, so I think in the Lake Taylor Quadrant, we have a lot of work to do. Um, part of that is just getting that together about the boundaries and how we want to work those schools, but really about those facility improvement opportunities also. We know mm -hmm. that both have needs, um, so we've done a condition assessment of those buildings to, to identify you know, our, our mechanical needs and our electrical needs and our roofing needs. And so on top of that, we've done some space needs analysis. So allowing the, allowing the facilities to promote the programs mm -hmm. that Dr. Brennan and her staff are, are working toward and continuing to improve is critical on our side. And so we're really excited about that opportunity in particular. Um, so this is, um, but that's not to forget that our other opportunities at the other high schools as we continue to improve the programs, we wanna make sure that we're not leaving the other high school programs behind. So including schools that I'm paying attention to the programs of Booker T. Washington, paying attention to the programs of that were that are very successful in other buildings too, like Norview and Granby and Maury. And so we want to make sure that as we develop that in our facilities plan, that we set standards and bring the other schools along and they're just not an afterthought to our planning efforts. Right. And with all of these assessments and all of this work that's happening, what are one or two priorities that uh, based upon their recommendations that you'd want to begin with? I've identified the Camp Allen Sewell's Point piece, the St. Helena feeder pathway. We're, we're trying to, to do mm -hmm. alignment that makes sense for children and families, and most importantly for their educational opportunities. Tracy just mentioned all of the work that will be going on in the Lake Taylor Quadrant and the work around uh, positioning for the comprehensive CTE High School, which will be a public, private, and business supported opportunity. For, for that comprehensive school will be the only one in this state that that is focused for everything to be together, the academics and the career tech opportunities all in one, and not just an academy and a school. So those, those are great opportunities. We keep thinking about what does the 21st century learning environment need to look like, mm -hmm. and how do we make sure we, we have that in a place for success. As we look at Working with the city council, we have to think about what are our facility needs. We've just opened the, uh, the fourth of our five mm -hmm. PPEA schools. So we, this school year, we opened Ocean View Elementary and Larchmont Elementary, the new schools. Last year, we opened, opened Richard Bowling and Southside STEM Academy at Camp Estella. The Camp, Estella, the Camp Allen building is under construction. And so what does the future represent in terms of our capital needs? Having this type of information and these various assessments allows the board to think about our needs and to set some priorities on where they would like to see the next set of investments occur for our school buildings. Mm -hmm. And how soon can any of this be implemented for the district? Well, it's interesting. Tracy mentioned the long-term and short-term uh, opportunities and goals here. Mm -hmm. Some things will be in place for next school year. We will be phasing some of the other pieces and the conversations around what will be the next set of buildings for capital improvement. Well, are, are conversations yet to, to occur? The board is going to set its priorities and then talk with council about it. And then we figure out what gets funded, you know. Uh, where does the city invest in this public education with this buildings? That's going to be very important. You viewers may be aware that the city and the schools have embarked on a revenue sharing model for creating some stability in terms of expectations for the base funding of public education. Capital needs are part of that. So these discussions will certainly help inform that, that work also. Mm -hmm. When listening to her and the con continuing conversation is going to be with the city, whatever, where does that put you with the next steps of what you do with cooperative strategies? So to, to follow up on the beginning of what Dr. Boone talked about early in the first part of this interview was the idea that planning is ongoing. It's not an event that we do. And so mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that we continue that, um, that dialogue between the academic world and the facility world to make sure that we are 
prioritizing the right facilities at the right time when at the right cost. So certainly we have some opportunities here to go specifically to the communities that we're going to be making some short-term changes for. So in the next couple months, we, we need to be talking to those specific communities at Camp Allen, Sewell's Point, St. Helena, those type of, the, mm -hmm. but going specifically into their neighborhoods and talking to them. So that's that's what we're going to be doing the next couple of months. In the spring, we are really going to, with the with the completion of a comprehensive condition analysis of the facilities, now we have an opportunity to really look at the division um, in the next 5, 10, 15 year parameter to really set our priorities in long term for the condition improvements of facilities um, because that's going to be an important piece as the, as the programs continue to improve and continue to move forward in this division. So our goals are to keep this going, is to keep the community involved, to get as much community engagement into this as we can. When we have public meetings, we, we engage people to be there. We try to keep it online. We do everything we can to reach a community. So our efforts in the next next six months is you should see us in your neighborhoods. Good, good, good. We, go ahead. And we're very appreciative of the Educational Planning Task Force. And these are community members appointed by the school board and some recommended by me as superintendent to help us think through this work. Um, we're not trying to do it in isolation and we're trying to be very transparent about this work. And so the, the next several months and, and years will be exciting in terms of how we, we deal with the learning environment and how we get at the goal, board's particular goals of reducing instances of hyper poverty schools. So there's a lot of work to come and all of that is, is around the, the very intensive and focused and structured work that we're doing to improve student outcomes, which as we've been able to do this year, you know, we maintained the 23 schools that we had fully accredited, added five uh, more schools to, to that list, and just recently the State Board of Education indicated that four more of our schools will now be partially accredited reconstituted schools. So the fruits of our labor are beginning to be seen in terms of the, the student outcome work. And so all of this goes hand in glove and in concert with each other because the environments are important for how, te how students learn and mm -hmm. where our teachers work. And they speak volumes about the community's investment in its public schools. And I think it's important that we're keeping the community informed and sharing information. And with that being said, we had the work session, now this interview. So if they want to know, Tracy, more information about what we're discussing today and the ongoing processes that are coming up, how can they learn more information about this? So they could go to the Norfolk Public Schools website, and we have a banner on there for facilities planning. And there's all the information for whenever we meet. We're always posting the presentation we do minutes from the meeting to make sure that people continue to stay informed. Great. We want to thank you for coming on the show today and expounding more about um, what's happening in Norfolk Public Schools. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. We want to thank you for watching NPS Now. It airs weekly on WNPS Channel 47, or you can view us online at www.npsk12.com. If you have any great story ideas or information you'd like to share, email us at NPS underscore news at NPSK12.com. Again, we want to thank you for watching. NPS Now.